Jung's Liebe Novus is a descent into hell, Jung's hell and possibly our own. My theme this morning is hell, and coming here this morning, I think it may have been easier to get into than this symposium. <laughs> the sign on the gates of hell in Dante's Commedia, abandon all hope, all who enter here, might not be out of keeping or come to mind when individuals first begin to grapple with Liber Novus, the spirit of the depths, and the dark denizens that lurk within. But all is not lost. As a denizen of this domain, nailed and chained to this book for what seemed fast approaching an eternity, and close at times to turning into a shade myself, I'd like this morning to provide some short dispatches from hell to help you on your descent. As the Christian designation for the dwelling of the dead, depictions of hell from the outset were superimposed upon classical descriptions of the underworld or Hades. The first major Christian description of hell occurs in the apocryphal apocalypse of Peter. In this, Christ shows Peter hell in graphic detail. People hanging by their tongues, a lake of flaming mire, another full of pus, clouds of worms, people gnawing their tongues and having flaming fire in their tongues and metal detectors everywhere. The key trait of these and similar depictions is the notion that in hell, punishments enact the nature of sins. In his 1893 work on this text, Nekaya, Albrecht Dietrich argued that the apocalypse of Peter drew heavily on Orphic Pythagorean traditions. Now, at the outset of Liber Novus, two descents have an exemplary role. Odysseus's descent into the underworld in the Odyssey and Christ's descent into hell. Descents to the underworld feature in different traditions. And as the underworld has been a main theme in the speaker that follows me, James Hillman, I pass all questions on the underworld to him. First to Odysseus. Book 11 of the Odyssey depicts Odysseus' descent into the underworld to consult Tiresias. To enter the land of the dead, libations mixed with honey, milk, then sweet wine and white barley were made. They then cut the throats of sheep, probably organic in that time. Tiresias then gives warning and advice concerning what lies in store. We will return to this motif, but just like to put this as one of the backdrops to, to the terrain we'll be entering. The second major theme is that of Christ's descent into hell, the harrowing of hell. The Apostles' Creed states that he descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead. It's very brief. But what indeed took place there? Accounts are found in the Apocryphal Gospels of his descent into hell to preach to the dead, to redeem the dead, and to redeem Adam. This formed one of, you could say, the the major themes in Christian theology until a reaction sets in in the Protestant Reformation. Zwingli, for example, took the account of Christ's descent simply to indicate that he had really died. Calvin dismissed it merely as a fable. The fusion of classical descriptions of the underworld and the Christian hell, which is its apotheosis in the most famous depictions we have of hell, that is Dante's Commedia. It's Botticelli's hell. In presenting his vision of hell and one's journey through it, 
Dante also presented a hermeneutics of how the text should be read. In his famous letter to Can Grande della Scala, he differentiated two modes in which the Commedia could be read. The first sense is that which comes from the letter. The second is that which is signified by the letter. The first is called the literal, the second allegorical or moral or anagogical. And he differentiated them in this text in the following manner. The subject of the whole work taken only from the literal standpoint is simply the status of the soul after death, taken simply. If the work is taken allegorically, however, the subject is man, either gaining or losing merit through his freedom of the will, subject to the justice of being rewarded or punished. Two modes of reading then, and in the second, hell features in an allegorical sense. As the historian D.P. Walker notes, hell began to lose its hold in the 17th century. And there were many reasons for this. The weakness of scriptural arguments for hell, the decline of the notion of retributive justice, the rise of rationalist modes of thought, and problems concerning the precise location of hell, traditionally conceived of as in the bowels of the Library of Congress, no, in, uh, in the earth. For example, in his article in Diderot and D'Alembert's Encyclopédie, Swidden argued that the number of the damned argued against the location of hell in its traditional place inside the earth, it was simply overcrowded. I mean, there was no, no place to fit them all. The only place big enough was the sun, and this had the added virtue as it provided enough heat for the eternal flames. So even then, they were in problems of global warming, ecology, you know, where are we going to find enough heat to burn everyone? Alongside this notion of the problem concerning the literal hell and its location was a metaphorical use of the word hell. The Oxford English Dictionary characterizes this as a place, state, or situation of wickedness, suffering, or misery. Place, state, or situation of wickedness, suffering, or misery. And it notes instances of first usage going back in the English language to Chaucer. In Milton's Paradise Lost, Satan, who was a reliable figure, states, the mind is its own place, and it itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. Satan knew a thing or two about hell. An instance of this metaphorical use is found in a statement by Meister Eckhart, cited on several occasions by Jung, and you'll see why. Therefore do I turn back once more to myself. There do I find the deepest places, deeper than hell itself. For even from there does my wretchedness drive me. Nowhere can I escape myself. Here I'll set me down, and here I will remain. The self as deeper than hell. Within the context of the decline of the belief in a literal hell, two figures stand out. Emanuel Swedenborg. In terms of central precision and graphic detail, it's only perhaps Swedenborg's hell which comes close to matching Dante's. Swedenborg a Swedish scientist and Christian mystic underwent a religious crisis in the 1740s, depicted in his Journal of Dreams. In 1745, he was sitting in a tavern in London. He heard a stranger say, don't eat so much. He went back home and that night, the stranger appeared in a dream and revealed himself as Christ and told him he would travel through heaven and hell and talk with demons and angels and dead and show people the true faith. He was told to note what he'd seen and heard and de demonstrate the symbolic meaning of the Bible, which he duly did. 
In Swedenborg's work, Heaven and Hell, Heaven and Hell were presented as strictly dichotomous. All things in accord with the divine order corresponded to heaven, and all contrary things to hell. In hell, the spirits of the dead continue their lives much as they did on earth. The main thesis of Swedenborg's work is encapsulated in his statement, heaven and hell are from the human race. Within each of us, there were two gates, one which was open to evil and to hell, the other to good and to heaven. What characterized those who are uh, are currently in hell was that when they were living in the world, they loved the flesh, the self, and the world, as opposed to the soul, the love of the Lord, and the love of the neighbor. Now, how did one get to hell? Swedenborg presents um, its geography. Hells were to be found under mountains, hills, and rocks, and their opening appeared like holes and clefts. Some of the hells appeared to the view like the dens and caves of wild beasts in the forest. Some were like the hollow caverns and passages that are seen in mines. Some hells present an appearance like the ruins of houses and cities after conflagrations. In some hells, there were nothing but brothels. There were also deserts where all is barren and sandy. Hence, there was a multiplicity of hells. One didn't see them by walking by them because there, a light only flashed when a soul was cast into hell Then one had a, some smoke coming up. So against the common belief that there was one hell which was the same for everyone, Swedenborg noted that there was an infinite variety in, and diversity. In a similar matter, manner to Dante, Swedenborg not only presents a vision of hell but also a hermeneutics, a spiritual hermeneutics. The Bible had two levels of meaning, a physical, literal level and an inner spiritual one. These were linked by the doctrine of correspondences. So I'll come back later to this notion of, in the visionary tradition, of a linkage between a vision encapsulating its own hermeneutics. The most acute reader of Swedenborg was William Blake. From his youth, this is a self-portrait. From his youth, Blake had visions of angels and historical figures whom he conversed with. And for a time, indeed, he joined the Swedenborgian church in London, where it was established. Blake became uh, con critical of the institutionalization of Swedenborgianism and began, began taking a more critical view of Swedenborg. Around 1890, he published a work, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. In The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, Blake articulated his critique of Swedenborg. Indeed, the very title, Marriage of Heaven and Hell, encapsulated his sense that these were not two radically dichotomous and distinct locations. Swedenborg's problem, he noted, was that he'd conversed only with angels and not with the devils who hated religion. He'd had the wrong informants. If you want to know what hell it's like, you've got to talk to a devil. I mean, it's, it's perfectly obvious. What Swedenborg had failed to see, Blake noted his annotations to Swedenborg, was that heaven and hell are born together. He, he articulated a notion of dynamic oppositions. What is basic is a series of contraries attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate, and these oppositions were necessary for life. What religions call good and evil were secondary terms, derivatives, which sprang from these basic series of contraries. They were not primary. At the same time, Blake then launched a critique of organized religion. And of Swedenborg, he noted, he'd done much good and will do much good. He's corrected many errors of popery and also of Luther and Calvin, but there was little that was genuinely new in his work and it ultimately served orthodox belief, despite its protestations to the contrary. It was Dante that great, 
Blake considered the, the greater figure. And as last year's, he produced a series of engravings to the Commedia of watercolors. That's uh, Lucifer, in case you didn't recognize him. <laughs> this by way of backdrop. We turn now to Jung. You have noticed that I've not mentioned Freud. As Eugene Taylor and I have been arguing for decades, Freud-centric legend of the genesis of Jung's psychology, namely that its origins lay first in Jung's discipleship and then divergence from Freud, has led to the complete mislocation of Jung in the intellectual history of the 20th century. That's the postcard version. It's only since October the 7th that the full extent of this has finally emerged into the public domain with the publication of Liber Novus. I would contend that to continue to argue that psychoanalysis is the key determining context for the emergence of Jung's psychology can henceforth only be regarded as acts of willful obscurantism. In no way does Liber Novus emerge as the sequelae of Jung's divergence from Freud as if it's enough to diverge from Freud and, and enter this vast visionary uh, domain. Rather, it should be located and situated within the context of the visionary tradition. For what Liber Novus presents us with is a way back to hell. A hell that was increasingly lost to the Western imagination. As noted, between the autumn of 1913 and the summer of 1914, Jung engaged in a lengthy period of self-experimentation, inducing fantasies in a waking state. Uncertain of his activities till the outbreak of war convinced him that his fantasies were precognitive. He then wrote a handwritten manuscript of a thousand pages, adding a second layer of lyrical elaboration, interpretation, and commentary. He then had this typed and retranscribed it into the volume we have upstairs. This was self-styled as a prophetic work. They begged this commandan the way of what is to come. Like Dante's vision of hell, like Swedenborg's vision, Jung's vision contains its hermeneutic within it in this layer two, an attempt to elaborate the significance of his fantasies. Thus, like Dante, Swedenborg, and Blake, Jung's endeavor was not simply to elaborate a work born of visionary experience to give it form, but to elaborate the hermeneutics of how it should be read. In a critical sense, then, interpretive commentary is superfluous. What is required is a wider contextualization this is the whole work uh, approaching you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a new form of a Jungian uh, optician's test. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, in terms of the Western cultural tradition, not a little has been written on Jung's relation to figures in his pantheon, such as Goethe and, in particular, Nietzsche but other figures have received scant attention, such as Dante, Swedenborg, and Blake. And I wish to speak a little bit of this now. In Jung's copy of the Commedia, there is a touching slip of paper inserted by the opening cantos in the line, in the middle of the journey of our life, I found myself astray in a dark wood where the straight road had been lost sight of. This was the situation where Jung found himself. In a lecture at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in 1935, Jung noted, a point exists at about the, 30, the fifth year when things begin to change. It's the first moment of the shadow side of life and of the going down to death. It's clear that Dante found this point and those who've read Zarathustra will know that Nietzsche also discovered it. 
When this turning point comes, people meet it in several ways. Some turn away from it, others plunge into it, and something important happens yet to yet others from the outside. We do not see a thing, fate does it to us. It's clear from this that Jung found an existential as well as a literary prototype for his activity in the Commedia. And there are indications that Jung was reading the Commedia during this period. On 26 December 1913, he transcribed the following lines from the Purgatorio into his black book. Unquote. And I to him, I am one who, when love breathes on me, notices, and in the manner that he dictates within, I utter words. Second quote. And then, in the same manner as a flame, which follows the fire, whatever shape it takes, the new form follows the spirit exactly. It seems to me these citations give voice to Jung's undertaking. They give expression to what he was endeavoring to do. In the manner that he dictates within, I utter words. He was transcribing what he was hearing in a faithful manner. And second, the new form follows the spirit exactly. This is his fidelity to the event. This is what he was attempting to bear witness to. In his published scholarly writings, Jung read the Commedia as a visionary experience disguised under historical and mythical events. Its significance for Jung as a historical document is found in his commentary in Psychological Types in 1921. He argued that the birth of modern individualism began when the worship of women, with the worship of women, quote, which strengthened man's soul very considerably as a psychological factor, since the worship of women meant worship of the soul. This is nowhere more beautifully and perfectly expressed than in Dante's Divine Comedy. So he situates it right at the birth of modern individualism, the worship of the soul. Jung then goes on to comment on several cantos from Paradiso, St. Bernard's Prayer to the Virgin, mother. I turn now to Swedenborg. First to highlight the significance of Swedenborg for Jung was Eugene Taylor, who's lurking somewhere there. So address all questions on Swedenborg to him. In his youth, Jung read through many volumes of Swedenborg. Though not directly cited, Swedenborg features critically in the backdrop to Liber Novus. At the very beginning of the text, Jung's turning away from the things of the world to the soul can be seen as parallel to Swedenborg's conception of heaven and hell. The turning inward, the turning away, that what he'd previously lived had been a hell, in the sense, a negation of the soul. There are also many similarities in the manner in which Swedenborg engaged, dialogued, and attempted to be instructed by figures in the spiritual world and Jung's endeavor in Liber Novus. The critical difference is simply one of ontology. Jung replaces Swedenborg's spiritual realism with psychic realism, his notion of essay and anima, articulated indeed in, in Liber Novus and then in psychological types. It's a simply a shift of ontology, a different manner of reading Swedenborg. Swedenborg's spiritual hermeneutics, reading the symbolic sense of the Bible, also appears to inform the hermeneutics of layer two of Liber Novus. Jung's relation to the works of Blake appears to be more ambivalent and oscillates, and this appears to be connected to Jung's ambivalence concerning the notion of art. In 1921, Jung cited Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell 
and psychological types, which indicates that he read it during this period when he was working on Liber Novus. Now, a curious thing about psychological types is the most read chapter has been the definition of types at the end. But it's to me quite apparent that the most important chapter of the text is chapter five, type problem in poetry. And the reading of psychological types is, will be in a, in a way completely transformed after reading Liber Novus. And the significance of this chapter will uh, be apparent in the sense that he's transposing or attempting to cast in a conceptual language some of the insights of Liber Novus. At the end of this, I say at the end of what I consider the most important chapter of the work, Jung notes, cites Blake's statement from heaven and hell that there were two classes of men, the prolific and the devouring, and that re religion was an attempt to reconcile the two. Jung then noted that this summarized the whole of his previous discussion. So that just says it all. Quite striking. In 1930, in a discussion of visionary works of art, Jung noted that poets turned to mythological figures to give suitable expression to their experience. This did not mean that they were working with secondhand material, but it was on the only way to give form to imageless primordial experience. So one starts with imageless primordial experience, authentic visionary experience, which then poets use mythological and historical figures to give form to. They've derived the figures from somewhere, but that does not mean that the visions themselves are derived from elsewhere. An important point to note in discussions of Liber Novus. Jung then noted, Dante decks out his experience in all the imagery of heaven and purgatory and hell. Blake presses into a service the phantasmagoric world of India the Old Testament and the Apocalypse. So in his view here, Blake's work contained visions from the collective unconscious clothed in mythological language. In 1939, in Jung's introduction to Suzuki's work on Zen Buddhism, Jung noted that the glimmerings of a breakthrough of total experience in the West were to be found in Goethe's Faust and Nietzsche's Zarathustra. Again, the usual suspects from Jung's pantheon. However, tucked away in a footnote, we find, quote, in this connection, I must also mention the English mystic, William Blake. In this connection. He can't not raise him to the levels of Goethe and Nietzsche. In 1944, in Psychology and Alchemy, Jung featured two images by Blake and one of his illustrations to Dante. The legend in Psychology and Alchemy describes this as the soul as a guide showing the way. It's actually a revealing slip. It's actually Dante and Virgil ascending the mountain of purgatory. In a 1948 letter, he noted, I find Blake a tantalizing study since he has compiled a lot of half or undigested knowledge in his fantasies. According to my idea, they are an artistic production rather than an authentic representation of unconscious processes. Here again, you find instances of this oscillation. It seems to me, as I was indicating, this oscillation concerns Jung's own ambivalence concerning his own work. Was Livanovus a work of art? The notion of the dynamic interplay of countries central to Blake's heaven and hell is a key theme in Jung's Liber Novus. Though there's no evidence to suggest that he derived this idea from Blake. Rather, it's indicative of what Jung may have found tantalizing in the reading and study of Blake. Around 1910, Jung went on a sailing trip with his friends Albert Uri and Andreas Vischer, during which Uri wrote out chap read out chapters from the Odyssey dealing with Circe and the Nakia. Jung noted that shortly afterwards, he, like Odysseus, was presented by fate with a Nakia, the descent into the dark Hades. This is then Jung's figuration of his self-experimentation 
a descent into the underworld. I'd like now to trace, briefly trace this motif. On the 21st December of 1913, in his fantasy, at the outset of his journey, in which he first encountered the biblical figures of Salome and Elijah, Jung gazes into a stone and catch sights, sight of Odysseus and his journey on the high seas, one of the first figures that he encounters. After his interchange with Salome and Elijah, he looks again into this stone, thinking again of Odysseus and how he passed the rocky islands of the Sirens and wonders if he should do so or not. He is there imagining himself in the same situation. In his commentary in the layer two hermeneutics on this passage, you noted that the image indicated that lengthy wanderings lay ahead of him. Odysseus had gone astray when he had played his trick at Troy. Then Jung notes, Odysseus would not have become what he was without his odyssey. So it's the question of the necessity of the wandering, of the erring, in terms of his becoming. In the handwritten draft to the second book of Liber Novus, Liber Secundus, Jung subtitled Liber Secundus, The Adventures of the Odyssey. In the corrected draft, this is retitled The Great Odyssey. And finally, Jung suggested the line from the Odyssey, happily escaped from the jaws of death, be used as a motto for Annie Eliaffe's biography of him, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, still misleadingly referred to as his autobiography. I come now to the descent into hell. It was a few weeks earlier, on December 12th, that he engaged in his first visual fantasy. In 1925, in a seminar, he recalled, I devised such a boring method by fantasizing that I was digging a hole. The fantasy then begins, I see a gray rock along which I sink into great depths. Well, this is a sensible procedure for anyone versed in Swedenborg. It's digging a hole in, a, in the rocks. That is where hell is to be found. Fantasy that ensues, Jung saw a killed figure float by on a stream and serpents who veiled the sun from which a stream of blood flowed. In 1914, as noted, Jung felt that these visions, these fantasies were precognitive. And he then titles this chapter, Descent into Hell in the Future. In this fantasy, he had descended into hell, and the bloodshed that he'd saw depicted what was happening in Europe. Quote, as the darkness seized the world, a terrible war rose, and the darkness destroyed the light of the world, since it was incomprehensible to the darkness and good for nothing anymore. And so we had to taste hell. Hell was now indeed let loose. It was the earth, the bloodshed and the slaughter of the Great War. The world had gone literally to hell. But critically, in Jung's account in Liber Novus, this was not senseless, but meaningful for the further development of mankind. I'd like to indicate further depictions of Jung's imagination of hell in the Benovus. On 12th January, he found himself in a gloomy vault with a tangle of human bodies. He realized then that he had reached the underworld or hell. On 18th January, 1914, after he'd been interred to in the insane asylum that uh, James Billington mentioned, he found himself in a steamer his neighbor in the ward, a fool who declared himself to be Nietzsche and Christ, told him simply that they were in hell. 
On 2nd February 1914, his serpent soul tells him that they had arrived in hell. He saw a hanged man who'd poisoned his parents and his wife. The man tells him that he'd done this to honor God so that he'd escape the wretchedness of life for a state of eternal blessedness. In a fantasy of 28th December 1913, he found himself in a castle in the forest where he met an old scholar. He's led to a room to sleep and imagines that the scholar has locked up his daughter, which seems to be a hackneyed theme for a romantic novel. She then literally appeared before him. And Jung notes, I'm truly in hell, the worst an awakening after death, to be resurrected in a lending library. I note that uh, the Library of Congress is, is not a lending library, <laughs> I think, but perhaps for some members of Congress. Have I held the men of my time and their taste in such contempt that I must live in hell and write out the novels that I've already spat on long ago? Does the lower half of average human taste also claim holiness and invulnerability so we might not say any bad word about it without having to atone for the sin in hell? So the canonical notion of fitting punishment in hell is articulated here. He despised such novels, so he finds himself condemned to literally be in one, forced to live them out. The contemporary equivalent would no doubt be finding his work featured in a New York Times article or a TV cop show. <laughs> Reflecting on this episode, Jung noted, your hell is made up of all the things that you always ejected from your sanctuary with a curse and a quick kick of the foot. What was required then was to give due attention to what led one to contempt and rage. And through accepting this, through accepting what one had rejected, one redeemed one's own other into life. Hence the notion of going to hell is seen as essential in affirming the fullness of one's existence and indeed of life itself. Life affirmation required an affirmation and an acceptance of hell. Hell epitomized the state that Jung found himself in, a moment of collapse of all that he cherished, all that he'd striven for, all that he aspired to and held dear, transvaluation of all his values. And he comments as follows, what do you think of the essence of hell? Hell is when the depths come to you with all that you are no longer, which you, I'll start again. What do you think of the essence of hell? Hell is when the depths come to you with all that you no longer are or are not yet capable of. Hell is when you can no longer attain what you could attain. Hell is when you must think and feel and do everything that you know you do not want. Hell is when you know that your having to is also a wanting to, and that you yourself are responsible for it. Hell is when you know that everything serious that you've planned with yourself is also laughable, that everything fine is also brutal, that everything good is also bad, that everything high is also low, that everything pleasant is also shameful. A complete moment of reversal. The Eckhartian, Eckhartian sense of the return to oneself as deeper than hell itself, or indeed the deepest hell. And Jung notes, but the deepest hell is when you realize that hell is also no hell, but a cheerful heaven. Not a heaven in itself, but in this respect a heaven and in that respect, a hell. This is indeed what Blake would have called the marriage of heaven and hell. What then does one do when one finds oneself in hell, in life? Jung found a prototype in Christ's descent into hell, the harrowing of hell. One of the key themes in Liebenovus is that of the invitation of Christ 
How is this to be understood? How is this to be lived? In reflecting upon this, Jung understood it not on a literal level, but on, in the steeper sense of living one's life as fully as Christ lived his. In attempting to do this, he had experienced something akin to Christ's descent into hell. Quote, no one knows what happened during the three days Christ was in hell. I have experienced it. The men of yore said that he preached there to the deceased. What they say is true, but do you know how this happened? It was folly and monkey business, atrocious hell's masquerade, the holiest mysteries. How else could Christ have saved his antichrist? Read the unknown books of the ancients, and you will learn much from them. Notice that Christ did not remain in hell, but rose to the heights in the beyond. In Jung's understanding, Christ's journey to hell was necessary. After, without this, he would not have been able to ascend to heaven. In Jung's account in Liber Novus, Christ had to become his antichrist, his underworldly brother. He had to become hell himself. Christ's task of the redemption, the salvation of the dead, is then taken up in what I call Jung's theology of the dead in Liber Novus. To cite one of the statements from the draft, quote, not one title of Christian law is abrogated, but instead we are adding a new one, accepting the lament of the dead. In Jung's theology of the dead, redemption does not take the form of literally saving the souls of the dead, but of taking on their legacy, answering their unanswered questions. After his work on Liber Novus, in his published scholarly writings, Jung attempted to translate some of the insights of Liber Novus to a language acceptable to a medico-scientific audience. One aspect of this undertaking was a psychological formulation and interpretation of Christ's descent into hell. In 1937, in his Terry lectures at Yale, Jung noted, three days descent into hell during death describes the sinking of the vanished value into the unconscious, where by conquering the power of darkness, it establishes a new order, then rises up to heaven again, that is, attains supreme clarity of consciousness. I'll read this again. You hear the, the change in, in language. The three days descent into hell during death describes the sinking of the vanished value into the unconscious, where by conquering the power of darkness, it establishes a new order, then rises up to heaven again, that is, attains supreme clarity of consciousness. In 1952, in Ion, he noted, the scope of the integration is suggested by the descensus ad infernos, the descent of Christ's soul to heaven, to hell, whose work of redemption also encompasses the dead, the psychological equivalent of this forms the integration of the collective unconscious, which represents an essential part of the individuation process. Again, I repeat, the scope of the integration is suggested by the descensus ad infernos, the descent of Christ's soul to hell. Its work of redemption also encompasses the dead. The psychological equivalent of this forms the integration of the collective unconscious represents an essential part of the individuation process. Here we find Christ's descent into hell interpreted as the individuation process and the integration of the collective unconscious, the central theme in Jung's later work. But we must pause here. Which language, which articulation is primary? First person voice in articulation in Liber Novus, or its subsequent reformulation decades later in the psychological concepts of the collected works. <clears throat> 
Relevant here are some comments that Jung uh, made following a discussion of none other than Swedenborg. See, this talk does tie in some loose manner. At a discussion psychological club in the 1950s. I quote, there are also visions whose pathological character can be recognized not from their form, but from their effects. Or also that they subsequently require continual working. For instance, Niklas von der Flue. He had a terrible vision and had to protect himself from it. Reinterpretation of the vision in the image of the Holy Trinity. Same with Swedenborg. He went up into his, this doctrinaireness to protect himself against the vision, since this was dangerous for him. He hitched himself to the concepts. One must also give the patient something with which he can hold on to himself, which he can grasp, equals concepts. The visions of Swedenborg are something terribly important. Also with him a danger is shown that he plunged into the abyss. Because of that, he had to hold on to concepts. These form a true salvation for many men. A very nuanced statement. Jung is saying that Swedenborg, to protect himself, formed concepts. But Jung is not merely being critical and in indicating for many men, concepts was all, all they would have to hold on to to be able to withstand the experiences in question. Now this raises the question whether Jung's later conceptual system which in some of his followers has not lacked for doctrinaireness, forms such a safety net or guardrail, vital for some, no doubt, but a protection which may block access to the very experiences in question. Taking this further, does Jung's significance lie in his conceptual formulations, the individuation process, the collective unconscious, the integration of the collective unconscious, archetypes and so forth, or rather that is, does it in the terms of his own visionary experience lie in the recovery of hell as made accessible through individual fantasy, through individual vision and enabling a new route to hell and back. If as Jung claimed, Dante and Blake clothed visionary experience in mythological forms, could we not pose the question that Jung in turn attempted to clothe visionary experience in conceptual psychological forms? If so, the power and significance of his work does not reside in his concepts, which are familiar to us, but in the visionary experience which was at the back of them. The publication of Liber Novus then finally enables one to reconsider Jung's significance in wholly new, yet quintessentially ancient manner as recovering the road to hell. Thank you.